This is an audio walkthrough of Under Layered Suspicion, a review, a review of CRA audits of Muslim-led charities. Uh, this particular walkthrough will focus on our third and final case study, the study of the International Relief Fund for the Afflicted in Canada, or in short, Irfan Canada. What's important to understand about this particular case, one, it is the most complicated of the audit cases that we examine in the report. It spans two separate audits um, and most robustly illustrates the interplay with, um, at the whole of government level, not only of the anti-terrorist financing regime, but more robustly the way in which global politics um, are received into the domestic political arena and, and then have implications for how bureaucrats working at the local levels work and operate um, and the kinds of um, assumptions they make as they sift through evidence, as they even select the evidence. So of all the case studies, um, this along with the Islamic Shia Assembly of Canada substantively illustrates the way in which the larger political climate certainly frames the uh, operation of the audit, though um, the CRA maintained in this case study as well as in others that it is immune from the larger political climate. And what this case study shows is that this notion of immunity from political climate operates in, at a very narrow level in terms of direct interventions by MPs and others. What we're showing is that implicit bias, systemic racism, systemic bias operates not necessarily in these formal procedural assumptions that the CRA makes, but they operate in the fact that no one is immune to the larger world in which we operate. And those, um, and those, the realities of our world, the realities of our experience necessarily influence the way we think about things, think about evidence and evaluate it. And so it does call into question fundamental considerations of how do we control for implicit bias when an audit op operates in the context of these already Ex, um, expressly systemically biased policies and a political climate that necessarily is, um, is affecting how we might see our reality. So for instance, in the Irfan Canada case, Irfan Canada was a humanitarian organization that was doing work, taking Canadian funding and charitable funding to support humanitarian causes out in the world, Bosnia, Afghanistan. But it was, um, it became, um, subject to CRA scrutiny for its work in the in, in Gaza, in the Gaza Strip and the West Bank, uh, both areas, the Palestinian territories under Israeli occupation. Now, what's important to note is that Irfan Canada came under scrutiny twice. There are two separate audits. The first um, occurs in, uh, in around 2002, shortly after 9-11. And so the larger conversation around the war on terror is, is, is rising is rising and on the and on the rise. The second occurs after 2006. And we'll explain in this audio walkthrough first the larger political environment that they're in, and then we'll turn from that to the audit structure. Now, in 2002, keep in mind that it's around this time that we find um, in 2000 in particular, um, uh, that there is a considerable amount of violence in Israel and Palestine. At that time, the coup leader Ariel Sharon had visited the, uh, the, uh, the Temple Mount along with a delegation of the coup party members and the contingent of Israeli police riot, um, riot, riot police, setting off what was effectively called the Second Intifada. Um, this then uh, overlaps with the war and terror that Canada and other countries participated in post 9-11 leading a larger domestic conversation about which party domestically is tougher on terrorism. At the time, the Cretean government was in power with the Liberal Party in, uh, in government in Canada, which of course prompted a strong contestation between uh, the more conservative leaning parties and the, the reigning Liberal government over who was tougher on terrorism. And so we see in this first period, shortly after 9-11, that there's a constant um, conversation in question period, politicizing issues of 
of, of the war on terror for purposes of each party anticipating the next election and its platforms going forward. And so, you know, there's a, there's in the context of Israel Palestine, a real focus on Hamas as a, as a terrorist entity. At that time, there was in, in, in many countries a division between Hamas's social organizations, terrible organizations, and its military slash political wings. Um, and uh, the reason being that Hamas was in fact viewing as, as a complicated organization, as many scholars of the region will say, and that it does have and run hospitals while it also has these other sort of entities that are more militant. And so how do you, how do you um, manage a war on terror that has, to, that has to police the terror-oriented vehicles of Hamas while at the same time maintaining humanitarian commitments to uplifting poverty when many of the principal service providers in the region are Hamas affiliated? It's a complicated political issue. There's no doubt about that. And so what we find is a, a politicization of this issue in question period, uh, as, uh, as uh, for instance, from the Canadian Alliance, Mr. Brian Palliser saying that, you know, saying how the minister, um, the minister has no clue on a great many things, certainly not on this issue. And some, some very heated remarks with uh, the Honorable Lawrence McCauley, the Solicitor General of Canada, um, quite indignant at the accusations from the other side. And so, what is a global political issue around violence over there transforms into um, an, electoral, an electoral political issue as between parties. We see, of course, Mr. Stockwell Day, in this case as well, taking on, for, at that time, Minister in Foreign Affairs, uh, Mr. the Honorable Bill Graham, again, around Hamas and Hezbollah, trying to see which party can be stronger on the war on terror. Um, and with, uh, with Bill Graham, saying, look, we are doing what we can to, on the one hand, push back on the terror front, while at the same time fulfilling Canada's humanitarian commitments. What was important, though, in this, in the lead up to Air Fund Canada is, in fact, Stop All Day. Stop All Day makes a number of, um, of concerning statements around what's going on in Israel, and particularly pointing the finger at Hamas. So, for instance, on November 20, after the November 21st, 2002 Jerusalem bombing, Mr. Stockwell Day gets up and says, uh, Mr. Speaker, yesterday with monstrous joy, Hamas once again celebrated its ongoing murdering of innocent children. He goes on, we, no we know now that the liberals in shame and not on principle may at some point reluctantly ban groups like Hamas and Hezbollah, as Great Britain and the United States did decisively long ago, with then the Honorable Wayne Easter, then the Solicitor General of Canada saying, that of course Canada condemns the brutal and senseless murder um, and talks about the listing process for Hamas. Now Hamas is of course on Canada's terrorist list um, and so on and so forth. But what becomes really important is of course, Mr. Stockwell Day taking aim at uh, on a regular basis, Hamas in the territories, its, it's, it's, it's occupation, its, um, its operations in that area. And then it wasn't um, until October 1st, 2003, that we begin to see how this, this, this global uh, political crisis has played out in the partisan context of question period, suddenly now begins to seep into how do we operationalize that in the context of the Ministry of National Revenue and the agency, which is the CRA. And so on October 1st, 2003, Stockwell Day says, Mr. Speaker, yesterday we were remind, we reminded the Prime Minister of a Canadian Hamas fundraising group that his security officials warned him about almost three years ago. As he will recall, the warning said, fundraising in support of violent foreign struggles takes place in Canada. Front groups operating in Canada include the Jerusalem Fund for Human Services. He goes on to say, um, he goes on to say, according to the Association of Palestinian Canadians, the Hamas Group's parent organization is the International Relief Fund for the Afflicted and Needy, which we have just learned is a Canadian organization that has tax deductible status. In other words, the Hamas Front Group can use its parent body to raise these funds and get a tax receipt, which then, of course, prompts Eleanor Kaplan, Minister of National Revenue, to ask him for more information for pursuit on the grounds of charitable audit review. 
This is precisely the conversation and question period that prompts the first audit. However, at no point did the tax auditors disclose that to Airfront Canada when they began their tax audit. It was only after the lawyer for Airfront Canada reviewed the Hansard's literature on, on question period, found this, found this exchange with Stockwell Day and said, is this why you're auditing us? And then of course, the answer was yes. Just to clarify on the second audit, the second audit also occurs in the context of highly contested global politics. Keep in mind that the, the, the second audit occurs after 2006. Now this is important, why? On February 6, 2006, Stephen Harper became Canada's 22nd Prime Minister with his Conservative Party obtaining a minority government in Parliament. Two days after Canada's federal election with the Harper government prevailing, Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza Strip went to their polls to elect the leadership of the Palestinian Authority. They were at that time frustrated with the then ruling party Fatah and its tendency towards corruption within the Palestinian National Authority. So as we find out shortly after the conservative win in Canada, it turns out Hamas wins the dominant majority of seats in the Palestinian Legislative Council in that election. So at the same time that Canada's Conservative Party comes to power under Stephen Harper, Hamas, through democratic elections, also takes power. As it turns out, by 2007, the, the, um, the, the West Bank and the Gaza Strip effectively were ruled separately, Hamas and Gaza, Fatah um, in the West Bank, but for this period of 2006 to 2007 um, and thereafter, if you wanted to do any humanitarian work with the government ministries in the Gaza Strip, you had to work with Hamas. They were the government elected democratically according to uh, international electoral observers. This of course raised serious concerns because by this point, Hamas had been declared a terrorist entity and that the distinction between its social wings and its military wings had been completely dissolved. And so there was no uh, bifurcation of Hamas. If you work with a Hamas run hospital, you're supporting terrorism effectively. If you run with Hamas, the Hamas led Ministry of Transportation in Gaza, you're now working with a terrorist organization. And so the conflation of terrorist entity and now Demo So uh, just because of the door handle, uh, the door bill, I'm starting my recording of this second part. The second audit occurs in the context of a, different, a very different political environment that we find. It needs to be remembered that in 2006, February 6th to be precise, Canada elected Stephen Harper as its 22nd prime minister where he obtains a minority government in parliament. Two days after Canada's federal election, Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza Strip went to the polls themselves to elect the, the leadership of the Palestinian Authority. According to international observers, the elections were fair and ought to be respected. And so there wasn't any indication of fraud in the elections. What's important to remember is that in these elections, Palestinians voted in Hamas into its legislative council. Hamas then obtained 74 of the 132 seats and therefore obtained a majority, which meant that in one sense, sections of the government of the Palestinian National Authority, which governs over Gaza and the West Bank, is governed by Hamas. For countries that list Hamas on its terrorist entities list, this, this proved a problem. How do you support and fulfill your humanitarian obligations to a government that is now ruled by a party in large part that you have now listed as a terrorist entity and preclude funding to. This became a problem. Now by 2007, it turned out that Fatah ended up adopting um, control over the West Bank and Hamas maintained control over Gaza. And so there were some workarounds created, but this nonetheless 
created a significant issue. And we see that as countries increasingly stopped separating the social wings of Hamas from the political wings, this became a problem for them. For those countries that still maintain a distinction, they could say, well, we can work with the Ministry of Transportation in Gaza or the Ministry of Communications in Gaza. That's the government ministry. That's the one most focused on fulfilling these basic public services. It may be Hamas run, but it's not the terror entity of Hamas that we're worried about. Or perhaps a hospital that is affiliated with, um, and that has loose affiliations with Hamas in, Ga in the Gaza Strip might also be a, a, a proper recipient of humanitarian aid. But for many, this wasn't an option. We see this, in fact, play out in Canada itself. And as the conservative government began taking much more strict measures against Hamas, deeming it and all that it touched subject to a terrorist uh, analysis, we begin to see that within Parliament, there is an increasing debate about what about Canada's humanitarian obligations. And what we have Ms. Caroline St. Um, uh, is very specifically concerned about this. She raises questions to the conservative government about Palestinian daycare centers supported by CETA not getting the support um, that was directed to them from Quebec-based uh, agencies. And, and, and this continues repeatedly. She raises this issue over and over again. She says on May 9th, 2006, Mr. Speaker, the Minister of, Minister of, of International Cooperation said that human, Canadian humanitarian aid money would not be going to Hamas. What we are talking about is a YWCA care center, 65% funded by CETA and sponsored by a, a Quebec organization, Ed Medical for la Palestine. These are donations intended for children, not Hamas. How can the minister say that the money is going to Hamas when in fact it is an Israeli bank that is refusing to transfer money intended for little children in a daycare center? It is hard to confuse that with Hamas. And so what we find is that question period becomes a site for debating. Does Canada have humanitarian obligations to the suffering of those in the Gaza Strip? Or will it be subsumed within the Conservative Party's tendencies to focus on terrorism, which as it, as it has so happened is what seemed to have been the case. And so what we have then is this political controversy wherein Canada has to decide whether or not it's going to participate in humanitarian challenges in, 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 in the humanitarian challenges in, in this region or rather focus on the, the tariff framework that it has adopted. What we find is that when it comes to the audit itself, the, these concerns about Hamas, these, um, this, mon this model around Hamas continues to play out. Now the government, the government's agencies are anti. They cannot decide whether or not there's something is a Hamas social institution or a Hamas political or military institution. There is a directive to say we make no such distinctions and that's fine that's their that's their that's their they're they're not that's a political decision and the agencies are subjected to it and that is fine the problem though is how do they then show the work in their evidence and their selection their analysis and what we find in 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 the first and the second audits right the first audit in the context of the second intifada the second audit in the context of Hamas's election, what we find is an incredible amount of incompetency in how they do their research. Uh, every administrative fairness letter was accompanied by an appendix, a set of appendices, which reveal the CRA charity directorate's research on the matter. And what we find here is a failure to question the integrity of their sources. Um, uh, end result oriented analysis and a series of assumptions around what life must be like over there that aren't substantively up updated or, or um, substantiated. So for instance, in one example during the first audit, the Medical Scientific Society, uh, which is one of the agencies that Air Farm Canada interacted with, is alleged by one source to have a connection to Hamas. Here there's a a book called The Palestinian Hamas. 
But what's interesting about that book is the book itself isn't interested in the government's framing of Hamas. The book itself gives a nuanced view of Hamas, one that allows for a meaningful separation between the social wings and the military wings. So even when that book does make passing reference to the medical scientific society, the director, the director, the charities director, nonetheless read that as therefore hard and fast evidence of its connection to Hamas the bad. Whereas in the book, that's not the argument being made about medical scientific society. In another example, uh, one of the organizations that was suspicious in the audit was the Jericho-based Orphans and Needy Care Charity, which was alleged to have a connection to Hamas. Now, the directorate, the charity's directorate, relies on an article by two authors that were posted on the Middle East Media and Research Institute, or memory. Now, most people in the, in the field of Middle East studies know all about memory. Uh, the mem memory, memory is, an, is a translation agency. Um, and, and what's interesting is that its origins actually come out of pro-Israel advocacy groups. So for instance, Mona Baker, a professor um, on Middle East studies writes, memory is a strongly pro-Israel advocacy group established in February, 1998 um, by a former member of its Israeli intelligence service. It elaborates a public narrative of itself as independent and nonpartisan. Uh, and repeatedly taps into the meta narrative of the war on terror by claiming to be a major player in the fight against terrorism. But what's interesting is reporter Brian Whitaker of The Guardian relates, after receiving many memory translations as free gifts, he writes, quote, the stories selected by memory for translation follow a familiar pattern. Either they reflect badly in the character of Arabs or, or they in some way further the political agenda of Israel. In no way does the charities director even recognize this as an issue or problematize its source for the translations. Another example, again, there's a, the director uncritically references documents on the Saudi Committee for Support of Intifada. Um, and, and this was material that was uh, made available by the Intelligence and Terrorism Information Center at the Center for Special Studies. Um, Middle East political scientist Pete Moore, however, describes this center as a quote, Israeli government funded organization run by former Israeli intelligence personnel, end quote, which is reportedly, uh, it says that it has these documents that were seized by the IDF during its attack uh, on Palestinian urban areas in 2002. The question though is, is can we rely on these documents when they're, uh, when they're shared by intelligence agencies? We, uh, we certainly have obligations as a state to um, respect the intelligence services of other states as they interact with us. But we also have obligations to our domestic citizenry to ensure that the intelligence we rely upon is reliable, to corroborate it with separate third-party evidence as well, which, what, which didn't happen. So what, what was interesting about all of this in the first audit, and then later in the second audit, is that there's an evidence selection bias in what's the so-called research process that then is used to substantiate the denial or the rejection or the revocation of charitable status. It's even worse in the second audit. The second audit is all about Hamas, what it is, how it operates, and so on. But what's really fascinating is just the failure of good reading practices. You know, I, though I'm an author of this report, I'm not a specialist on Middle East studies, but I'm just a careful reader. Anyone who's a careful, close reader will see the failures of how of the research methodology. So for instance, in the second audit, uh, the government of Canada, its charities directorate, um, adopts a major uh, claim in the Washington Beltway that the delivery, quote, the delivery of social and humanitarian services is an integral part of Hamas's operational strategy to fulfill its operational, its political goals. We therefore do not accept claims that support provided to Hamas can distinguish from the political and terrorist activities that led to it being listed by Canada and other nations. That's fine, that's a fine starting point. The problem though is not every scholar they cite begins with that starting point. Not every scholar agrees with that. And so for instance, though the directorate relies extensively on Jerome Gunning's work on Hamas, Jerome Gunning himself says that this is not how we ought to proceed. A careful review of Gunning shows that 
The government's inference from his work is exactly opposite to what he is trying to show in his book. A careful review of Gunning shows that this is precisely not the conclusion he supports. On the first page of his book, Gunning begins by criticizing Western politicians and policy bureaucrats for their simplistic rendering of Hamas's welfare network as solely dedicated to funding, promoting, and supporting terrorism without much consideration of what other purposes this network might, might serve and what contradictions this introduces. In other words, the directorate relies on Gunning to prove exactly what Gunning says is unprovable. Very bad reading practices. And so it calls into question the quality of their research. The second example from the second audit is the directorate's intense reliance on Matthew Levitt's study of Hamas. Now, Levitt himself is an interesting character, um, uh, a bureaucrat within the US financial services industry. Um, but Levitt's study is well known for promoting the position that Hamas's wings are indistinguishable. So it's a convenient academic source for the government's position. The problem though is that and as, 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 uh, as Irfan Canada's lawyer um, explained, is the only way you can, exp you can rely on that is if you have a fungibility thesis around money. That Terence Carter writes uh, to the charities director, the fungibility argument suggests that Hamas is actively involved in terrible organizations in order to facilitate the fungibility of funds across the Hamas organization. From this, however, Levitt extrapolates that support to all charitable organizations or Sakat committees in the occupied territories is indirect support for Hamas. Now, there's, there's, so this is, this is an important analysis that like you have to presume a number of financial flows between organizations, connectivity, um, evidence that, that, that the charities director certainly doesn't rely upon. But what's important about Levitt's work, and this is really important, Levitt's book was published in 2000, May 2006 by Yale University Press. There was no way Levitt's book in any way anticipated Hamas being elected to government. The book is clearly not written in that fashion. And in a variety of reviews, particularly Stephen Erlanger, um, his Erlanger says that Levitt's conclusions make very little sense once we take into account Erl, uh, Hamas's victory in 2006. In fact, Erlanger says quite expressly um, that Levitt's book appears to have been quickly massaged to take some account of major events that occurred after the manuscript was already turned into Yale University Press. So to rely on Levitt's book to address Hamas post-2006 is methodologically incredibly flawed. Now, of course, what's important is that, that even if we take Levitt's book on its face, the, scholar, the scholarly reviews on it have not been positive. So Pete Moore, again, a Middle East Studies professor, writes that, um, that Levitt ignores most of the scholarly and comparative literature on the Islamic resistance movement of Palestine and similar in groups to deploy instead primitive arguments not addressing any known academic debate. He relies on highly biased data, misrepresents some of his sources, and in the opinion of this reviewer takes the kinds of shortcuts that would end most graduate student careers. Now, what's important is that the charities director knew of all these criticisms, didn't really care. Kathy Hawara, who was then director general of the charities director explained simply by saying, well, look, Dr. Levitt is a respected member of the US administration who has a lot of experience in this area. She's not addressing the fungibility thesis. She's not addressing the methodological flaws in, her, in, in Levitt's analysis. She's not addressing the, that the book was published in the very year Hamas's situation changed politically. All she's doing is, a reference, is responding to all the academic critiques by reference to Levitt's status. It's a deference, an argument of deference to US government authorities without our own internal due diligence. This is highly problematic, it seems to me. Um, there are more examples, but this audio recording has already gone on quite a long time. So what I wanna do is simply end by saying, this is not uh, a question about whether or not you agree 
with Hamas or whether or not you dis distinguish between its political and military arms, in every single one of the case studies, we show fundamental failures of research analysis, clear research bias, evidence selection bias, all things in deference to a particular political outcome that seems already imminent in the air. Now, obviously we can't prove that, but the coincidences when you layer the political environment globally, the domestic reception of that political environment in let's say question period, and then the audit practices, when you look at all three of them across every single case study, the analysis seems to suggest patterns of systemically framed political, aim, uh, political involvement uh, in which the auditors are clearly influenced by their political environment by imperatives from their political, uh, from the political government and in, in the, the party in power and so on and so forth. What can we take away from the Irfan Canada case? There's so many issues in this case. It's hard to focus on just one, but clearly we need to think about the way in which domestic practices as mundane and ordinary as an audit are nonetheless still connected to debates and question period which are themselves reflective of a larger global order within which Canada is an active participant. We also need to think about the kinds of um, capacities and competencies within these ministries and whether or not they're really able to do the so-called research they say they do. There are some basic errors in research methodology that are having serious repercussions on the well-being of Canadian citizens and Canadian charities, and really unfairly so. And lastly, we need to really start thinking hard about the, the, um, the work being done by Canada's anti-terrorism finance policy in structuring the way these audits take shape, the questions that are asked, the intelligence or research that is done, because it does seem to me that one cannot uh, escape the shadow of anti-terrorism financing as it is structurally biased, as we've shown elsewhere, in the way it operates here on Air Farm Canada. Thank you very much.